All right. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Uh, today, we are going to talk about the so-called intervention, uh, aka invasion in Haiti. Um, I have a little more to say on that in a moment before I introduce our amazing guest today. Uh, before I do that, a few housekeeping things. We are building this platform in addition to what we do over on our audio podcast right now. Obviously, um, that takes a lot of time, effort, labor to do. If people can support us on Patreon, that is much appreciated. You can do that at patreon.com slash millennials are killing capitalism. That link is in the show description. And I know many of you who are watching already do that. So thank you genuinely. Um, if I had time to thank all of you individually, I, I would. Um, uh, the other things, just like the video, share it with folks, please get it out in front of people, um, you know, subscribe to the channel. All of those things help get these conversations to a wider audience, which is important because what we're trying to do is to help people achieve political clarity on these issues. And that's important because it's a step towards taking decisive action collectively. All right. So enough of that. So I wanted to say something fairly basic up front for folks. Um, you know, I feel like I probably shouldn't have to say this, but I still think it's important to say. Um, one is that we did launch this YouTube page at this time, obviously, um, and we were quite clear about this to bring a lot of focus to what is going on in Palestine right now and what is being done by the Israeli state with the full military and ideological support of the United States and the West, right? What is being done to the Palestinian people. And um, we will do some of that today and continue to do that this coming week and as long as it's necessary because the situation in Palestine and for the Palestinian people in Gaza is incredibly dire and urgent. Um, so we don't wanna lose sight of that. Um, folks who saw the initial message when we launched this though will remember that we did also say even from the very beginning that we also wanted to hold space to have conversations about this impending invasion of Haiti. Um, before the events of October 7th, we had uh, signed on to say that we would do an event to support the Black Alliance for Peace's call to shut down AFRICOM, which they do every month, I mean, every year in October. That is their international month of action against AFRICOM. Um, and so, I wanted to say something clearly just so people hear me on this, even if they don't like what I'm about to say, uh, which is that we can and must stand against the genocide of Palestinians in this moment and against the climate of re-intensified Islamophobia and anti-Arab sentiment that the West is stoking in order to demonize Palestinian people in our eyes. Um, and so we must stand against that, right? We have to be very clear on that. And without any contradiction or deprioritization, deprioritization, uh, we must stand together against the U.S.-backed Western invasion of Haiti, and we can stand and call to shut down AFRICOM alongside that as well. And we can do all these things together because the struggle for Haitian liberation and the struggle for African liberation internationally, these are struggles against Western imperialism and domination, just like the struggle for a free Palestine. So, this discussion today, we're going to be centering Haiti and talking about that. But I just want people to, to understand that struggling for all of these things together doesn't make our movements weaker. It actually makes them stronger, right? Because uh, Western imperialism is organized internationally um, against all of these people, right? And so we can be organized internationally against Western imperialism. So to help us make these connections, I'm super honored and excited that we can welcome today's guests. I know that all of you that are here, I'm sure, know her, so I won't do a long introduction. Uh, Dr. Jamima Pierre is a professor of global race in the Institute of Race, Gender, and Sexuality and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia and a research associate at the Center for the Study of Race, Gender, and Class at the University of Johannesburg. Dr. Pierre is also a member of the Black Alliance for Peace, and I'm sure holds other roles there beyond just a member, and the author of The Predicament of Blackness, Postcolonial Ghana, and the Politics of Race. Dr. Pierre, welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so It's so good to be here. 
so yeah i mean first i should say this is long overdue i think that you are the really the preeminent scholar um around haiti and also i you know i know you're you're an activist and organizer around this too and that you know you have a lot of really valuable things to say and to point people towards on this topic and i encourage people to engage broadly with your work you've done many interviews on uh black power media uh work with um why am i blanking um black agenda report and and so much more and so i i definitely encourage people to to check out all of that as well um, so could you start just by explaining a little bit of what the current situation is in Haiti? And I recognize that's always fraught to start with the current situation because the history is so important as well. Um, many of our listeners, I'm sure, are like loosely aware of what's going on, but I'm also quite sure that many are not really at all. Um, so could you say a little bit about the conditions that have led to this intervention, so-called uh, which was approved earlier this month, as I understand it, by the UN Security Council. Yes, but first I'd like to give all solidarity to the Palestinian people. Um, it's, it, 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 it is with a heavy heart, actually, that I join you today as we see um, bombs dropping on um, people and seeing um, thousands of babies um, being killed. Um, and while the world is watching. So I'd like to really um, make a statement against this genocide that is happening, but also um, give solidarity to um, our people in, in this Palestine. Um, and, um, you know, our, our, our hope and our goal is, to, is for Palestine to be free. So I'd like to begin with that. Um, what's going on in Haiti um, is, is actually, uh, linked in a particular way, um, not with the, this gross, uh, spectacular violence that we see in Palestine, but the way to think about Haiti right now is to think about Haiti as a colony and, and, and Haiti having lost its sovereignty. And I know we'll get to that later in 2004. And so to begin this is to understand that since 2004, Haiti has not been in control. Haitian people have not been in control of their own governments and their own countries. And this happened because France, the US and Canada hatched up a coup d'etat um, where they met, you know, they met in 2003 in Canada and late in Ottawa and created, hatched up a coup d'etat, which was then um, sanctioned by the UN because the two security council members are the ones that actually hatched up the coup d'etat. And we're, we're able to get the UN to do um, to provide a so-called stabilizing mission to consolidate the coup d'état. And so from then on, everything that's happened in Haiti has happened under um, the the rule of the UN, the UN office in Haiti, which still exists, even though the twelve thousand military soldiers, uh, the, the number of soldiers have diminished. But since two thousand and four, the UN, the US in particular, but we know the US has a structural majority of the UN. Um, the UN has been in control of Haiti. And if you watch the news today, what you'll see is Haiti's beset by gang violence. The whole country's taken up by gang violence. Um, Haiti's in chaos. It's, you know, going into, you know, it's falling back into savagery because that's the language they want to use when it comes to, to Black people. And um, and so what, what you see is this idea that there's a major gang problem that's supposedly based on the UN um, um, rendering that this is a cause for international, um, this demands an international response because this is uh, 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 an, uh, against international stability. And so they're saying that they need to send a military intervention to stop the gang violence in Haiti. But what's really going on is that the US set up um, um, a, a puppet government in 2010 um, mind you, we've been under occupation. So every election since then actually has not been a real democratic election. But in 2010, it was the most egregious 2010, 2011 election cycle. The U.S., which is right after the, the coup d'etat, I mean, I'm sorry, the earthquake that happened in January 2010 that killed um, a couple hundred thousand people. The U.S. paid $38 million and insisted that elections take place at the end of the year, even though you know, more than a million of the population was still living in tents, had no addresses and so on and so forth. They removed the largest political party from the elections and they forced the elections with the help of the OAS, the Organization of American States. 
And they put in place a political party called the PHTK and brought in Misha Martelly as president of Haiti. This was especially egregious. And I write about it. I wrote about it back when it happened in 2011 in that the first round of the elections, first of all, only 18 to 20 percent of the people voted in the elections. The first round, the, the candidate that the U.S. wanted, Michelle Martelly, did not make the first round. Hillary Clinton flew to Haiti and 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 this is based on WikiLeaks papers, WikiLeaks papers, flew to Haiti and threatened the sitting president with exile if he did not take the call to basically change the election results, which is exactly what happened. So by 2011, Michel Martelly comes into office, chosen by Hillary Clinton and the Obama administration. And this is where you have the beginning of the end of the, the fall of the Haitian state. And so what you have is the lack of elections, you have corruption, um, you have all kinds of things. There's the use of so-called gangs like armed men, you know, uh, as, as using as used as political, um, as a way to get political things done, as a way to go against people who are protesting against um, economic dis disempowerment, economic disenfranchisement, and so on and so forth. And so this is what you have. And by the time you have, you come to 2020, 2021, where you had um, Martelly's successor, which was also brought into power against the wishes of the people, against the protest. Of, of thousands of Haitian people in the streets all the time was assassinated. The UN office in Haiti handpicked the prime minister and put the prime minister in office. And so, and by this time, we actually have, since from 2004 to now, we had hundreds um, of elected officials. Haiti now has no elected officials, period, not in the regional, local, or national level. So, this is where we are. But at the same time, Haitians have been protesting against U.S. Um, um, intervention, against U.S. Um, uh, inter, uh, interference in Haitian affairs. Since 2019, we had the um, Petro Caribe protests, and when I and I can talk about that later, where Haitian people were saying there was all kinds of malfeasance. Petro Caribe was this fund set up by Hugo Chavez to help Haiti develop. The U.S. was completely against it. Well, the, the corrupt government that the U.S. put in place stole billions of that money. So people were in the, in the streets protesting from 2018, 2019. And then when when um, uh, Jovenel Moise, which was the uh, de facto president, illegitimate because he um, stayed past his mandate, people were in the street protesting him and protesting the U.S. for upholding him and putting and keeping him in power. What they used to do was basically send armed gangs to actually um, harass the protesters. And then this prime minister that the U.S. put on in power basically was saying these are gangs, they're not real protests, and so on and so forth. At the same time, people were protesting. If, if you look in the news from 2019, 2020, people were protesting against everything, including IMF push to remove fuel subsidies for Haitians. And that was one of the key protests um, back in 2019, 2020, um, 2021, even 2022, because this prime minister actually removed the fuel subsidies. So up until very recently, this discourse around gangs was not the main discourse around when we, if you look at the news media in Haiti. And for the past two years, ever since the assassination, and the U.S. knows who causes the assassination because they have all the evidence and they've been prosecuting some of these um, um, uh, uh, participants. And they, 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 um, they're holding a lot of this information in secret that we're not allowed to see. So the, the U.S. has been trying to actually have an armed intervention since, two, since the summer after the assassination. And it's being held off because people have been protesting and the U.S. tried to get Canada to lead an intervention, Canada said no. And then it went for CELAC, which is a Central American countries, to lead this intervention, they didn't. Then it went to Brazil, Brazil didn't want to do it. And I have to, I'll go back and talk, talk about the fact that it was Lula's Brazil that led the intervention in 2004. So that's a whole other conversation. And then, and then finally, they were able to talk the CARICOM countries into doing it. And then they convinced Kenya with a hundred million dollar and all kinds of goodies to come in and lead this intervention. But what we know is it's an intervention supposedly to stop gang violence, right? Um, um, but that is it's a non-UN intervention, even though it's being given the go ahead by the UN, which is key for us because it's not being paid for by the UN. It's coming, the money, it's the $200, $200 million is coming out of the Pentagon's budget so it's a U.S. mission given cover by Kenya and other Black countries in the in the nation. So 
we're saying that this is an intervention for gangs, but it's really an intervention for the U.S. to uphold its control over Haiti and to make it cheaper because then you can you to give it a black face so that it doesn't look like the U.S. is occupying Haiti. Thank you for breaking all of that down. Um, that's, you know, I think an excellent overview. I just want to say hello to a few different people um, in the chat. Good morning, everybody. Um, and also thank uh, Agreed Emma. Um, uh, also, this is a good point from earlier on. Um, and thank you for signing up for Patreon. Patreon. Um, so just wanted to say hello to some folks. Good morning, everybody that's in here. Um, so, you know, continuing on, one of the things I think many younger folks that are, a lot of people are becoming politicized, I think, in, in this very moment. And so it's important, I think, that we help folks to make these different connections um, and you know, one of the things I think people are coming to grips with in in regards to Palestine is, uh, you know, the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank do not have, or, or I should say, their national sovereignty is not recognized in any meaningful way. They're not able to, um, they don't have their own nation state. They're not able to determine certain aspects of their daily lives. Obviously, we see this with the siege on Gaza quite clearly in the way that you know, their internet, their electricity, their water, so on. Um, they can't even, you know, control their access to those own things. Um, and, you know, there's obviously, as, as you mentioned, you know, this is a heavy heart for both of us right now, you know, having this conversation. Um, and that doesn't even get into, you know, the level of war crimes and crimes against humanity that are going on in this egregious, um, as you said, spectacular instances of violence that are going on um, in Palestine. Um, but you just laid out, and I think it's really important for us to to name this, th there's this real denial of Haitian so sovereignty as well. Um, and I don't think that, um, you know, as you laid out just now, like Haitians don't have, uh, you know, the authority over the key decisions and affairs of their own country. Um, and so, I, you know, I know you've laid this out already, but I'm curious if you have more to say about your analysis of this question of sovereignty for Haitian, for the Haitian people in this moment. Yeah, definitely. You know, one of the things that this been fascinating um, thinking about Haiti is all the, the pundits and academics who talk about Haiti don't recognize that Haiti is currently under occupation. Because if we don't under if we don't acknowledge the first step, which is that Haiti's under foreign occupation, has been under foreign occupation since 2004, so much so that every year the UN renews the mandate of the so-called BNU office, the UN office in Haiti, which actually controls everything, which the core group, right? And they've been there since 2004. They have no Haitian members. They make all the decisions. They're the ones that pick the prime minister with a tweet <laughs> in 2021, right? And so, so I think the first thing we have to think about is, is the, the notion that Haiti is under occupation. So Haiti has, no, has lost sovereignty. And if we do that, then we can see Haiti's, Haiti's struggle as, a, as an anti-colonial struggle. I'm not anti, a de, you know, a, 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 right, an anti-colonial struggle. And that way, and because then we, we no longer exceptionalize Haiti, right? People are saying, oh, when they, you hear about Haiti, it's like, oh, those poor Haitians, they can't catch a break. Oh my God, they're suffering so much. We don't want the pity. We want analysis that shows, that demonstrates that our sovereignty has been snuffed out. What's fascinating to me, and when I'm thinking about Palestine, I think about you know, the news media representing this is that Israel versus Hamas, as if Hamas is a state with its right. own power and, 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 and they're not recognizing the colonial situation that, you know, the settler colonial, the violent settler colonial situation that's there. And I think about this because I think the UN during the occupation, the, the, the military occupation where we had at any given moment, 12,000 military police from all over the world and then police and then a whole, uh, a whole, um, civilian corps running Haiti. You know, I would go to Haiti and then I'd be in the tiniest little village where my grandfather was. And you see a huge tank just right in front of the, the little houses with guns pointing at people. Haiti was not at war. 
we were under occupation, right? And so I think about that because I think about um, the, the, the notion that sovereignty is something that's not allowed for certain people. So I say this because, did you know that Haiti was one of the founders of the League of Nations in 19, was it 1919, right? And I didn't, I didn't know that. Right. So Haiti was one of the founders of the League of Nations. But you know what's, what was happening in 1919? Haiti was under occupation. The U.S. had invaded Haiti in 1914 and then stayed there to 1934, 19-year occupation. And this was under Woodrow Wilson. So the U.S. was giving its mandate on how to, you know, how to write the charter, the, you know, com, you know, the Articles of Incorporation of the League of Nations, even though the U.S. never joined the League of, League of Nations. And the League of Nations is the pre, you know, the pre-UN organization, right? The League of Nations comes right after the First World War, where the Europeans, you know, take, take over, take over the, the bounty, right, the colonial bounty of the losers of Germany, of Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, and you know all, all of that, Japan. And so this was the, the, high, the highlight of European colonialism, right? It established Europe, European colonialism under international law. And this is how you have the creation of Pal Israel, right? The, the taking of Palestine and creating the, the under, putting Palestine under a British mandate, which was then given over to the Zionists. Right. So we think about these moments where you have Haiti under occupation, but the League of Nations refuses to accept to acknowledge this occupation because Haiti, through the U.S. occupation, sent a representative to say Haiti would be part. So U.S. Pan picked the representative that would go meet at the United at the League of Nations. Right. So the assumption for Haiti that the Haiti can be sovereign while under occupation gives Haiti a very different definition of sovereignty than other then uh, you know sovereignty. Then for us, is not really sovereignty. It's just sovereignty under tutelage, right? So this idea of sovereignty is very important for us because we're not given it. But part of it is this notion that we're less than that we cannot attain sovereignty un unless it's under the tutelage of 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 the U.S. And in the language of the early 1900s, where people were saying, you know, the language that the U.S. government used to to occupy Haiti. Um, and to say that this was not really an occupation, we're saying, well, you know, they're in our yard. We're, we're like their big brother, you know, and they haven't, you know, they haven't, um, um, uh, they're not civilized enough to rule themselves. And so we're just going to help them out, which is exactly what the mandate system was. Because, you know, actually, the truth is, most of my research is on the African continent. And, I, and I've been writing about the mandate system on the African continent and how the mandate system was what formalized colonialism under the rules of international law to make it seem like it wasn't colonization. But in Article 22 of the mandate, of the League of Nations mandate, it says these nations who are not yet ready to take care of themselves will be under the man mandatory, they'll become under mandatories of these European nations. So this is a similar thing, but that's why Haiti is so unique, I think, um, and, and, and you can see languages, is that you can claim Haiti has sovereignty while it's under occupation, which is the same thing that's happening today. So when you see stories about Haiti and you're saying the Haitian government calls for an intervention, there's no Haitian government. There is no Haitian government, right? And there's no there's no legal entity that's speaking on behalf of Haitians. If you go if you go through the UN, United Nations meetings, the people who present on behalf of Haiti is the UN office, the BINU office, which is now run by Ecuador. Before that, it was run by the US, um, by Helen Laline, this French woman, who everybody hated in Haiti. So, so sovereignty is important, but the thing is when it comes to countries that are not white, sovereignty, we're, we're non-sovereigns, right? And, and sovereignty is something that is, is not, you know, is, is not something that's, a, a, um, that, that's something that we, we should get according to them. Yeah, no, that's a very good breakdown again. Um, yeah, a lot of people in the chat agreeing too with the points that you are making. So um, so another aspect of this that I think is, is really, um, you know, I always hesitate to call these things interesting because they are interesting in some sort of academic sense, but they're also really evil and terrible. But um, 
the the this particular intervention um, has some dynamics to it that are rather unique. Um, you know, you've laid out some of this, how it is ostensibly kind of an anti-gang kind of security policing procedure. That's the sort of guise that this is under. Um, but as you've said, you know, given Haiti's lack of sovereignty um, and the fact that it's not allowed to host its its own elections, it's not, you know, it, there is no governing body that is elected by the people of Haiti. Um, you know, these decisions are being made on their behalf. And, you know, I think, you know, you've laid out that this is not just neocolonialism, you know, which neocolonialism would imply um, that Haiti has some level of foreign sovereignty. Uh, I mean, has some level of sovereignty, um, but is still sort of under a... Um, you know, kind of an agreement, I guess, with Western imperialist nations where it, it plays a sort of, uh, it's it's not entering into an antagonistic role, right, with imperialism. Um, but this, you know, that's really not the case in this in this instance. It's, it's quite different. Um, and so the other reason, though, that I think it's unique is because, as you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the, the forces, and it, and this is not unique in Haiti's history, you know, to some extent, um, but the forces that are going to come and, and do this, going to come carry out this mission. And I don't know the degree, maybe you could tell us, I know it's already been like sort of approved by everybody. I don't know the degree to which it's already occurring. Um, but, um, you know, it's primarily going to be African countries, I think, Caribbean countries. Um, you could probably give some specifics on that, that will be the sort of police and military forces um, in this inter in this invasion. So, what are some of the important dynamics and elements of this for you? And, and how do we need to think about this? Okay, so having Kenya lead the, uh, the, the inter invasion intervention is actually not new for Haiti. And that's what people don't want to realize is that the, what the U.S. has done, which is the beauty, is have every el everyone else do, do its bidding, do the dirty work. So that, and that's why, you know, the article that I wrote recently for NACLA, Haiti as Empire's Laboratory, I point out that the UN, the 2004 um, coup d'etat and then sanctioning of that coup d'etat by the UN was actually US, the, a, a shift in US policy where they managed to get the UN to basically take over an occupation for them, where in the past, it would have been like the US military sending its, you know, its, its soldiers, even though it did do that, you know, by the time the coup d'etat happened in 2004, um, it, it, you know, it, it had, you know, the Marines were there because it's the Marines that went to the president's office, put them on a plane, I mean, to, to his house at the middle of the night, put them on a plane and flew them to Africa, right? And so the Marines were there, but they were able to do that. So the minister, minister, which was an acronym for the UN occupation in Haiti that happened from 2004, once the UN office began, this was supposed to be, I think, a six month deployment, which lasted 14 years, right? So <laughs> just think about that. But it was not just the US soldiers. This is a multinational, multiracial occupation force in Haiti, right? So. So, so, and, and let me, I, I wrote, I write, wrote this down because the WikiLeaks paper says the minister force, this is the U.S. ambassador to Haiti, called minister, quote, a remarkable product and sim symbol of hem hemispheric corporation in a country with little going for it. She says, there is no feasible substitute for this U.N. presence. It is a financial and regional security bargain for the U.S. government. So, what, so by the end, by the time you have this occupation and from 2004, you have, um, um, it was like the minister leadership was run by Europeans, but all the, so it was run, it was led by Brazil. So the, the largest military contingent was UN's um, Lula Brazil, which spent two, $750 million and sent all this military. And ironically, it's the same military people that ended up being behind him being put in prison. <laughs> you know, later on. But so if you think about, so so there's that, but then you had everyone participating, C C uh, South American, Caribbean, and African countries, including Argentina, Colombia, Grenada, Bolivia, Benin, Burkina Faso, Egypt, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, Rwanda, Senegal, Cameroon, Niger, Mali. In fact, Rwanda actually led, you know, took over for about a year 
as part of this 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 intervention. So so that's that's what we have to know. And this is what uh, this uh, this legal scholar, um, uh, her name is China Mievel, calls multilateralism as terror. Because what happened is, and we have to think because the West always talks in terms of the rules-based international order. This is this is not a unilateral move. This is multilateralism. Well, they use the UN and then turn multilateralism as a way to implement imperialist policy and in terrorist ter terroristic policy. So through the UN, and I have to remind people, under the first, under this UN occupation from 2004 with all the military, they're they're the ones that brought cholera to Haiti because they dump they were dumping feces in the main water source in the central part of the country and infected over a million people and people are saying they killed 10,000 most people are saying they were they weren't keeping numbers they you know it's like you know a lot of people are saying it's actually more like 30,000 or more of people who were killed and that's by by cholera and that's what i mean by spectacular violence right you have the spectacular violence where bombs are dropping and you see thousands of people dying the un killed more than 30,000 people with cholera in Haiti and nobody said a word that did not even make the news. It was as if cholera just happened because Haitians are dirty, not the fact that UN brought it and dumped their feces in our water. And they, it took them six years to acknowledge, and they still have not paid us reparations or fixed the, the water system that brought cholera, right? But now it makes it seem like gangs are the ones bringing cholera. If you read the newspaper reports, gangs are bringing cholera and so on and so forth. So I wanted to say that because it was a brutal brutal occupation that still has replications. The UN, UN soldiers were running sex rings. Um, in fact, uh, one of the uh, uh, local organizations actually are su they're suing the UN because they left so many, they impregnate so many little girls. And so there are all these UN kids that they're not, they're these babies who are the result of these rapes and exploitation that are not being taken care of. They, they call them the UN babies, right? So this is what occupation has meant for Haiti, death, misery, sexual exploitation. But we don't see it because, you know, bombs are not dropping necessarily on us, but we, they are going into the neighbors and shooting up people. And, 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 and killing people with other things. So you kill, the UN kills 30,000 people and nobody's calling them gangster, right? Nobody's saying this is a genocide, but the reality it is, if you think about the way that the UN has. So this mission is not, the first mission was a UN mission and the UN is still in Haiti, but this one is to actually send, to get, to, support, to make it seem like it's the UN, UN backing, which is why they kept going to the UN Security Council. But what's key to this is that they kept saying it's a non-UN mission. And you have to ask yourself, why do they have to keep saying it's a non-UN mission, right? Because when we say non-UN mission, it just means that they don't have to go by the rules of the UN mission, right? They don't have to go by the rules, the political commitment of the UN. But they're, but they're, but they can say what well, the UN gave us the blessing, which is what the whole, you know, they were going to go in anyways. But now the way that they reported it is as if it's a UN mission to Haiti when it's a US mission run by Kenya. And so that's why I think this part is much more egregious. The idea that bringing Kenya in, it's not new, but it is much more egregious because it's much more open and vocal. So, and then Kenya is using the language of Pan-Africanism, which is even more egregious, egregious for me. But Kenya, did you know that Kenya and Haiti did not have diplomatic relations until the week that this thing, this this UN mission passed. Kenya and ha what does Kenya know about Haiti? You have the president talking about they're gonna teach their soldiers French when the majority of Haitians don't speak French. So they don't know anything about Haiti, but they're being used, you know, as as a as the black face to cover for Haiti. And the same two weeks before, conversations were being had, not with the Haitian government, but the US government in Kenya, where Lloyd Austin flies to Kenya and signs a five-year security deal with Kenya to fight Al-Shabaab, and then promised Kenya all this money and all this development, so-called development aid. That's what it is. The Kenya is being, you know, we're being sold for, what are you, a mess of pottage? Is that what they say that in the Bible? <laughs> what are that? We're being sold for, you know. A, a, I'm not a, I'm not good on my scripture, sorry. <laughs> right, or a bag of silver or whatever it is, right? But it is. Yeah, it 30, is really 30 pieces of yeah, 30, 30 pieces, pieces of silver, silver right? yeah. more like five pieces of silver, right? And so you have to laugh to keep from crying because it's so absurd and so terrifying to see that this this Kenyan and, and you know, this Kenyan force is just the cover. It's a thousand, they say police, but people are saying they're paramilitaries. And we know Kenya's police is has a reputation for brutality. So the fact that this is happening, this is colonialism. 
Because the truth is the British did the same thing in West Africa during the 1920s, 1930s. They brought Caribbean soldiers to fight against, you know, to, 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 to conquer West Africa. So this is a continuation of, of basically using, you know, us against each other for the aim of, of, of um, extending empire. Right on. And definitely, hello, Ricky. And yes, shout Hi, out Ricky. to the Black Alliance for Peace, Haiti, America's team. Um, folks, if you, you know, one shout out to all the Black Alliance for Peace members in the chat, because I know there are many of you. But also, if you're not that familiar with Black Alliance for Peace's work, or if you're interested, even if you're not, I mean, obviously, if you're Black African, you know, or African, definitely, you know, get involved and organize. But also, they have solidarity organizing. I know that um, non-Black people also participate in as well. So, you know, get familiar, sign up um, for their mailing lists and things like that, and figure out ways that you can support or be involved with what they do. Um, and yes, uh, Mark, I agree with the the vomit emoji of Pan African imperialism. So, um, all right. Um, so, and yes, don't donate. I'm assuming that's donate to Black Alliance for Peace. Yes, absolutely. Support the work that they do as well. Um, so, I, there's this, you know, and this has already come up in the chat a little bit, and we've talked about this. Uh, you've talked about it a little bit. The, you know, another resonance in this moment that I've been thinking about, and this is something I always think about because I, you know, I got into a lot of politics through like prison abolition stuff and things like this and thinking about these kind of these legal frameworks that get used to sort of deny people to, to criminalize people, but also to make that criminalization sort of so extreme that it, it basically suspends what would be the the kind of normal liberal rights rules of law or international law. And obviously, again, like Gaza right now is is such an, you know, an extreme abhorrent example of this. Um, so the terms that I'm thinking about here are the term gang member, which is obviously a very racialized term, and the term terrorist, which also is i mean you know very rarely are european white american people um the term called either of these things honestly but um but yeah they're not called terrorists they're not called gang members typically um and you know these these terms do a lot of work in terms of demonizing people in terms of um you know taking away a notion of um a people acting even in accordance with international law. I mean, even even in instances where you can have what towards the middle of the century probably would have been deemed a legitimate anti-colonial resistance movement can be branded as a, a, a terrorist movement very easily, I think, in these days. Um, and similarly, the work of, of gangs and, and gang members does a lot um, specifically with respect to Haiti, but also we see these resonance in the United States, you know, I mean, you know, you can look at all of the ways that gang laws have been used to sort of collectively punish uh, black populations within the United States, irregardless of whether people had any relationship to any criminal activity or whatnot. Um, and so, you know, it's it there they're interesting in that they they open up these forms of collective punishment and collective criminalization that are, can apply to populations um just you know broadly speaking which again if international law had some kind of real force in the world right uh just as a as an abstract concept then it would seem that those things would be not allowed because you're not supposed to collectively punish people, right? This is, this is, you know, one of the sort of central themes, right, of sort of humanitarian law and so on. So what is your assessment of the category of the gang or the gang member uh, with regards to Haiti and how this has been used to justify this intervention and um, sort of further this denial of Haitian sovereignty? Well, I mean, the, the 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 gang situation has been ongoing for the longest time, right? The the, the what's interesting, I I I've been saying somebody should do a a, a project where you read um, how 
you know, the, the, the Western media works in concert, right? We've seen this over time, and especially since the war, you know, in Ukraine and now with, um, with what's happening in Gaza, you know, with the brutal Israeli bombardment um, and, and genocide in, in, in Gaza, is, is you know, the, the me every time there's about to be a UN Security Council meeting on Haiti, the media covers Haiti. Usually Haiti is not in the news until something's, and they cover Haiti in the breathless take as if, you know, create the impression that Haitians are savages and, you know, uh, th that a military response is the best response to a current disaster. The only way you can deal with Haiti is with force, right? And so they create this narrative over and over. Just think about this. You just had a mass shooting in the U.S. this week where you, there have been more mass shooting deaths than days in 2023. If the mainstream media reported on that mass shooting, on those mass shooting deaths in the same breathless language that they report on what's happening in Haiti, everyone would say we need to send an armed military intervention into Haiti, right? Everyone would say that. I mean, not into Haiti, into the US. Everyone would say that, right? So, so think about this. And so the word, you know, the word gang, the word bandit, they used it. They use it after the Haitian Revolution in the 1800s. They used the word bandits when, when the Kakos, which was the Haitian um, insurgency, what well, they call insurgency, Haitian revolutionary um, movement against occupation from 1914 to 1919, where there was the Kako movement, they called them bandits. We must kill the bandits. Do you know that Haiti is the first place where the US dropped bombs? That the aerial bombing was used on a population? They dumped, they dropped bombs on villages killing thousands of villagers because they were protesting intervention. This is the early, you know, this is 19, 1918, 1919, right? So, so they've always used that language, right? And, and it's, it's really, you know, I, I wanted to just read for you, because I had to look this up quickly. And, and a New York Times article by Haiti in 1891 says, quote, no more monstrous spectacle could be presented to the civilized world than is furnished to it by the present condition of Haiti. That condition is the natural sequence of the modern application of modern institutions, of the applications of modern institutions to a savage people. For it must, must be borne in mind that Haiti is ostensibly a republic. That condition is the natural sequence, however, of the application of, what is it? The, the republic submits to the rule of an ignorant, violent person who is as much a savage as any chief in the heart of Africa. This is a New York Times editorial in 1891. And you can hear resonances in how they talk if you read the latest about gang violence in Haiti. No conversation about the fact that all the guns that are being brought into the U.S. come from the U.S. and go through the five ports that are privately owned by the Haitian elite. But as I always say, the biggest gangs in the world are the U.S. government. I mean, how much or Netanyahu, like how much gangster can you get by, you know, dropping bombs at people, using that language, changing election results? The gangsters are the ones in suits calling, talking about international law as they, you know, kill millions, right? And disturb the entire world. But we won't ever see that. And so you have this internal so-called gang problem in Haiti that's being that's being made bigger by because the US keeps sending guns. And you know, one of the biggest so-called gangs actually acts right near the US embassy. They know exactly. The UN just put out a report about who's behind the gang violence, and they named the former president Michel Martelly, which you know the US installed as the people who are actually arming a lot of these young people. So you have to ask the UN, for example, how do they reconcile this call for violent invasion with your report that says, that tells you exactly who it is that's bringing guns to the country. So I think the discourse, the dehumanizing discourse around gangs, around terrorists, as we see it in terms of Islamophobia, is to actually open up the space for violent treatment. It's a dehumanizing discourse that then says whatever violent use, whatever violence they use against these people is, is merited because it's a civilizing violence. Because, and that's, that's the exact 
you know, that's colonialism, right? You need to you need to bring civilization by any means necessary, even if it means decimating most of the population that you think, you know, that you say you need to civilize. So it's, you know, and they use that right with the so-called gang problem in the US, right? In LA, gang wars and so on and so forth. What's fascinating to me, and 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 I hope Africans are watching this, because how do you think Africans have been represented in the West? I mean, back in the, you know, back in the 80s, you know, it was about like, you know, the, the economists had this famous cover in 2000 and it said it had the cover. I, you guys, you should look it up. It says the hopeless continent and it had a cutout of the African continent with a young guy holding a gun. Right. And so you would think that the entire continent was just a bunch of savages running around with guns, killing each other. And so to have Kenya, you know, take on this take on this, this, despite this long history of the way that the white West has represented Africa and those of us African descent, to me is the most egregious um, thing to, to, to happen. And, and, and I hope we take the time to learn the history, to remember this, but to also know that the dehumanization part is what happens. That's how colonialism continues. And what we need to do is actually flip the script and call who the real, and point out who the real gangsters and terrorists are. And they are the, the, the white west because they're the ones wreaking havoc on our planet right now and killing us and we need to stand up and do something about it right on thank you um we have at least one question in the chat that i'll get to in a second and you know i'll give folks space if they have anything else to drop you know one or two in um before we do get to that um, because it is the international month uh, to shut down AFRICOM, would you mind just saying a little bit for folks about what AFRICOM is and, and why Black Alliance for Peace holds that call every year at this time? Right. And um, the so the Black Alliance for Peace has a number of teams. And the, one of the teams is the Africa team, which focuses on the African continent. And they do have... Um, uh, the month app of action for Africa. But the U.S. has several military commands and um, they have CENTCOM, which is in, uh, which is in Europe. They have um, um, SOUTHCOM, which is in, in, in the Western Hemisphere and AFRICOM, which is supposedly, you know, uh, um, for Africa. And it's a military command system where basically the U.S. military is expanding its, its military control over parts of Africa. So it's Southcom, it does that in the Caribbean and Latin America. And, and what it does is it uses so-called soft power and aid. So it works with USAID and it says it's going in there to actually, they do um, military exercises to train um, um, soldiers. And, but it's really a military, it's, it's a military takeover, uh, an attempt to take over the continent and, 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 and wield its power. And so, uh, AFRICOM is, 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 is important because this is how the U.S., this is the way the U.S. uses it. Basically goes in there and has access to the local militaries and basically uses these militaries to do its dirty work. Um, Ghana signed the deal with AFRICOM, for example, that, you know, basically the soldiers can be in there um, and they have, they don't have to, they don't have to abide by the rules of the Ghanaian state. The Ghanaian government doesn't have any say over them. And so, you know, and I and I have to say this: Africa was started. Was it? I think in um, I think with George W. Bush, um, I think 2007, 2008, and then really formalized under Obama. And the first leader of Africom was a black man, Kip Ward. Um, and then most recently, this guy named Langley is the leader of Africom. That's the other thing I wanted to point out. Just just to go on the side is how many black people are running the empire's machinery, right? If you think about Linda Thomas Greenfield, who was the lone vote against the, um, the, the, the ceasefire intervention called in the UN Security Council against um, um, the Zionist entity. And then you have Langley, you have Brian Nichols, who's part of the State Department that was pushing for this intervention in Haiti. You have Lloyd Austin, you have Kamala Harris. So it's just really, fascinating to see that. But AFRICOM is the US, the extension of the US military on the African continent. And we are completely against that. Um, most of the coup d'etat is actually, most of the, uh, in, on the African continent, especially um, on the West Coast, actually a lot of these people had training in the US. They're, you know, training by AFRICOM. And so we're completely against the extension of military, US military presence throughout the world. We want the closure of the 800 military bases and we want the US out of Africa. 
and we want the U.S. to stop controlling Africa through military means. So that's what Africa is about. Right on. I have to lift this up because folks need to know why I was kind of smiling and during that last uh, part is uh... somebody's putting away um, <laughs> silverware and dishes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's Sorry. all right. Um, no, no, no. We're, we're, we're thanking. That's, that's appreciated. So, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I'm sure there's a typo, but Dr. Jamima Pierre, could you explain why other CARICOM people seem to promote a conflict relationship with Haiti, um, uh, Bahamas and Jamaica, I hear, but also want to be UN interveners. I don't know if you had anything to say about that. I guess why people, you know, join these missions. Well, I mean, the missions are, uh, they join the missions, and this is why when you had the minister mission, you had so many countries participating. Just think about that. The UN provides job opportunities and salaries. When they join these missions, these poor countries, their soldiers get training, right? They, Haiti becomes a training ground. But not only that, they get full salaries. These countries were not able to get that. What's fascinating about CARICOM and Haiti is that CARICOM and Haiti have a very fraught relationship. CARICOM, um, actually a lot for the longest time did not want Haiti as a member. Haiti only recently became a member of CARICOM in the late 1990s, where P.J. Patterson really pushed for it, um, the former prime minister of, of Jamaica. And um, you know, there's always been um, there's always been a, 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 an anti-Haitianism in the region, and and that goes back to the Haitian Revolution, um, where um, the demonization of Haitians, right? They they made Haitians seem as if they, they were big savages for defeating the whites, um, for using voodoo as a religion um, that really helped um, galvanize people to 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 fight against um, slavery and colonialism, and most of these most of these countries in the Caribbean. Um, and parts of Latin America actually did not have a struggle for colonization. They were given a, a struggle against colonization. They were given independence by the former master. And then when it comes to the French territories, they never became independence. They just became um, territories, you know, outside, you know, extended territories. There's a formal term for it. I can't remember the uh, territories outside um, um, of France. And so when you look at some of the most actually um, draconian immigration laws, they are by Caribbean nations against Haitians. So the Bahamas and, and Jamaica have some of the worst immigration laws against Haitians. CARICOM has always been, you know, part of the problem because Haiti's too African, speaks a very different language, and Haiti's population is so large. Haiti has a 12 million popu people population. So Haiti's presence in CARICOM alone makes Haiti 60% of the CARICOM population, right, of all the nations. And so they've always been afraid of Haiti's uh, 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 numerical uh, superiority, but also their cultural um, anti-Haitian, anti-Black things that, that occur. And so, and so having Jamaica, which are in Bahamas, which are some of the biggest neo-colonial governments um, that we have in the region, um, participate in this makes perfect sense because these same countries participate in military training, um, Operation Trade Winds, right? I think that's right, Erica, <laughs> who's watching, um, you know, participate in uh, Operation Trade Winds, where, you know, they all participate in this imperial um, military exercise um, that, 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 that happens. And so, but the other thing is, I wanted to point out the, the hypocrisy of places like Jamaica, because Jamaica, for the past two years, was under a national state of security because of gang violence. I bet you you didn't know a few months ago, a gang burned down a whole neighborhood in Jamaica and, and, and that barely made the news. Can you imagine if the Western media reported as breathlessly on Jamaica's gang violence this, 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 these past two years as they do on Haiti? They won't do that. Mexico, Mexico has cartels. Why is there no intervention? Why isn't the UN going into Gaza to stop the genocide. You know, it's what's fascinating to me, and, and, and we should all be outraged by this, is the fact that as the Zionist entities dropping bombs on this, what was it, this tiny concentration camp that they've created for the Palestinians, the UN Security Council was meeting about Haiti, sending it on, not meeting to help Haiti, but meeting to like ratify this you know, this is last week, they had a meeting on Haiti for this military invasion. But nobody, what are they doing to stop the carnage that's happening right now? So you know there's something completely wrong with all of this, but, but, but neo-colonial 
countries participating in Haiti's oppression is not is nothing new. To, and that's a sad, sad reality, because if they really cared about Haiti, their draconian immigration policies would be out of place, um, you know, would not be in place. Um, and 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 they would not be pushing for military intervention, especially what what the U.S. did to Grenada, right? You're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Grenada in intervention, where Jamaica participated in that as well. So let's remember that, right? And so, it, that, I guess that's the only way I can answer that. Yeah. No. Thank you. So this, I don't know too much about this legal battle. I don't know if you could speak to it at all. Uh, the question was, any chance will Kenya will decline to invade due to this current legal battle? Well, Kenya is a complete neo-colonial, has a complete neo-colonial government, right? Um, and so, so there's that. The the only reason this, you know, word on the street is that there are actually already some Ken, about 200 Kenyan military folks um, uh, in Haiti already. Um, this legal battle is not a legal battle as much as it was an opposition member in a group, uh, some groups of, I forgot their names, that actually went to court to say that this was unconstitutional. They went to court in Kenya and the Supreme Court put a stay um, not, and, and basically blocked any deployment of Kenyans until they reviewed it. Um, just last week, they, they they were supposed to rule on it last week on October 24th, um, but then they, they pushed it back again to November 4th. So my guess is the U.S. pressure will be too great. Um, the, the parliamentary folks in Kenya have already voted, you know, they've agreed to it. So my, my, my guess is that the U.S. pressure will be too great for them to go against this intervention. But I appreciate the fact that I know that people have been protesting against this intervention in Kenya. Uh, finally, people are finally learning about Haiti because, you know, that's the other thing. One of the things I, um, I have to remind people is that outside, you know, we, you think about Western control of media here. The West controls the media throughout the world. So, you know, and I've been, I've been all over the continent and I'll tell you this, the biggest media powerhouses that most people watch are CNN, BBC, Voice of America and Al Jazeera in that order, right? So if CNN is telling you that Haiti has a gang problem that's taken over, you know, we got to go in and help, everybody's going to believe that until you, you know, you read local newspapers and the news, you read the, the stories are sourced through BBC, right? So let's be real about this. And so part of it is like, it's not the people that we're concerned about, it's the governments that are completely bought and paid by the U.S by the US government. So Kenyans can protest all they want. I mean, it would have to take thousands of Kenyans on the street, regular Kenyans on the street to stop their government from sending um, from sending its forces to go kill Haitians. But you know, I don't hold out hope because I know that the US will be able to get its way um, 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 by, by, by pushing the Kenyan, um, the courts to, to, to allow this to happen. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of this. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. If I missed one, folks, please ping me quickly here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just leave it with final thoughts from you. If you have anything else that you want folks to be aware of, to check out any like, you know, I mean, I, the last thing I would say is like, as folks are, you know, in the streets protesting and organizing as they should be for to stop, you know, genocide in Palestinian, like, to stop genocide on the Palestinians, like, please be sure to hold these, these other issues, Haiti chief among them, you know, with you as well, you know, um, you can, you can help people make the kind of connections that Dr. Pierre has made uh, today. And again, I think that I don't think that takes away anything. I think it just makes us stronger as uh, organizers and as political educators to make those connections for folks. Um and yeah, I don't, I don't know if you have anything that, that you wanted to say in closing. Yeah, I I, I do I, I do want to um, sh give a shout out to um, um, Erica Kane and Austin Cole, who actually wrote a, a great, great essay called The Unspoken Colonial Contradiction of Haiti, which brings together that ties Palestine and Haiti together. And I think you can go to hoodcommunist.org and, and find out. Um, I, I do think it is important because it's the same um, imperial project that is behind the destruction in 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 Gaza right now the 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 establishment of the Zionist state and 75 years of unrelenting um, um, 
um, brutality against the Palestinian people um, displacement. And, and with Haiti, you know, um, Michelle Ruff Trio, the Haitian anthropologist, calls Haiti the longest neo-colonial um, experiment in the history of the modern world because Haiti has had to deal with um, um, ever since its successful revolution in 1804, has had to deal with the backlash, what we call the counter-revolution by the Europeans um, um, against its, the nation. And so there's a violence that's happening um, um, in Haiti that's not as spectacular, but it is a violence that, that comes with occupation, that comes with colonial rule. And so one of the things that I hope we all remember when we leave here is to think about the Haiti situation as a colonial situation, and that we need to put up an anti-colonial struggle to stop it, and then link the link 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 the the conversations, right? Because, you know, um, we are all in this together against white Western imperial rule, and if we don't stop it, we won't have a world to leave for our children. And so, I just hope we all really continue to make these con um, 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 uh, connections. And thank you so much, Jared and Millennials Are Killing Capitalism, um, for having this conversation because I think it's important that we that we do make these connections. Absolutely. Thank you. And Justin, shout out to Justin, a uh, good friend of ours, um, had this question. I wanted to get it in before we close. So you mentioned how voodoo played uh, a role in the initial Haitian revolution. Uh, is the it's the religion is what religion. he was trying to write there. Is the religion active in the resistance today at all? Do you, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, I think voodoo has always been very important to Haiti, uh, to, to Haitian society, and it's still very important. So important that during the 2004 coup d'etat, you know, the Vatican got involved. You know, they were so, you know, they, 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 they pointed to voodoo, you know, as like the evil, you know, religion of Haiti. And that's why we need to get rid of this, you know, the elected uh, government. But I, I, you know, this question actually makes me think one of the other things I wanted to say is Haitians should not be pitied. Um, one of the reasons why the imperial powers continuously try to get down is because it's a result of Haitian pushback and resistance. And so we have to think about, you know, they've been trying for two years to get this mission. And for two years, the Haitians have been pushing back against it, fighting back. It's because of Haitians, um, 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 you know, power to fight back continuously. That's why the empire is so insistent. And so we have to remember that because it is, you know, the, the way that we see it's, you know, it's the Palestinian resistance that's keeping people going. It's the Haitian resistance that's actually keeping Haitian people going, despite the fact that empires try everything to bring the people down, they're still standing. And that's how we have to remember that is this constant going. And in that sense, then, you know, religion matters, you know, the voodoo matters, but also people's like ongoing fights and very clear you know, analysis of imperialism. That's one thing people don't realize. Haitians have a very clear analysis of imperialism and that they've been consi consistently saying, and they know who it is, who their oppressors are. And so that's what I wanted to end with by saying that it's the resistance and we need to basically support resistance, support resistance against imperialism. And and and, and we need an end to, 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 to Western white world supremacy. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I think we'll go ahead and close it out there. Appreciate you and your time and all the folks listening. Yeah, share this, you know, share this conversation with others. Hopefully it's an educational and an organizing and a political education tool for folks. Um, yeah, much appreciated. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be thank here. Thank you. Thank, thanks for coming on.